You are listening to the War on the Rocks podcast on strategy, defense, and foreign affairs. My name is Ryan Evans. I'm sitting here with Michael Kaufman to talk about the war in Ukraine. Mike, thanks for joining the show again. Thanks for having me back. The security supplemental finally passed the U.S. Congress, opening up quite a lot of military aid, among other things, to Ukraine. Uh, What can we expect to see in terms of how this will change Ukraine's ability to stay in the fight and continue to fight? And then, uh, then we could talk about some other things. So I think my perspective on it is that this supplemental does three things. First is it buys time at a much needed moment. The second is it creates the opportunity, right, to do a number of things with it. And that, of course, depends on on how this funding ends up being used both by us and by Ukraine, right? And the third is that it creates certainty because one of the big challenges so far heading into this year has been a tremendous amount of uncertainty over what kind of material assistance Ukraine can expect. And it's hard to plan around things or make a strategy if you don't know if you're going to have ammunition or you're going to get equipment or you're going to get training support. And so now at least the certainty is there. The time it buys us, to be honest, is probably another year. So the truth is that the supplemental might well carry, uh, help carry the war, you know, halfway into 2025. But to be frank, I don't know if there's going to be another supplemental of the size after this, right? So this particular package is going to have to be used wisely. I think everybody involved understands that. The immediate effect, of course, is a supplemental unlock shipments of ammo. The United States can ship ammo within probably about two weeks. And Ukrainians themselves have some reserves that they can now spend down knowing that they will be replenished. But much of the equipment and other things will take time to arrive. It'll involve a number of conversations laying out the plan, what the vision is, how to create additional Ukrainian units, sort out training with whatever personnel they plan to mobilize this year. And to be honest, when it comes to things like the ammo, I think a lot of conversations sort of fixated on this earlier on. But as I've said many times before, Ukraine has a number of challenges that have accumulated besides ammo, manpower, fortifications, issue of sustainment and maintenance that have to be addressed. And the ammo is not going to bring Ukraine up to parity. It's going to reduce the disadvantage that Ukraine has. It's going to meet their defensive needs. But Russia will still have a fairly significant advantage in overall fires. I'd like to return to some of those, but let's talk about the state of play at the front. Let's start about what has become Russia's main line of advance. So the Russian forces have been pressuring the Ukrainian military along several parts of the line, which has been typically the way they fought over the last two years. And the two main points that they've been focusing on is a steady advance from Avdiivka towards the main road that runs from Pokrovsk to Konstantinovka, which is often called for short Konstaka. And it's clear that their main effort is to sever the ground lines of communication running across Donetsk and to try to reach Pokrovsk as one of the central transit hubs. The second line of effort is to push from Bakhmut to Chalsev Yar, are currently on the outskirts of Chalsev Yar and have crossed the canal. And if they take Chalsev Yar the high ground, then they can hold at risk the main lines of communication to Kramatorsk and Slavansk, which are the main population centers in the northern part of Donetsk. So still focused on taking the rest of the Donbass. They are also pressuring the salient that Ukraine created in the south during the offensive last year. If you remember the long-running fight from Arikhiv down to Robotna. And it looks, I can't, at the time that we're recording now is, I think, Friday. So it looks like they've largely taken Robotna at this point. You know, as best I can tell, they're making steady incremental advances. Ukrainian military is having challenges, particularly, I think, manpower is the biggest problem overall, take the longest to fix. The problem with these advances is they steadily set up Russian forces in a position to then make a surge effort potentially this summer. Let's talk about how Russia has been pressuring Ukrainian infrastructure and strikes into Ukrainian-held cities more generally. We've seen heavy strikes on Kharkiv more recently, Odessa, uh, where else? They've been going on after energy infrastructure, particularly energy generation. They've gone after many of the major cities. I think you can add quite a few to your list. The Parisia, Dnipro, large parts of the south. They've struck most things other than the main port infrastructure in Odessa as well. 
the reality is that the Russian military has been saving up both drones and cruise missiles for these strikes. They become effective or more effective over time in conducting them. They've done considerable damage, as one can tell, to critical infrastructure and vindicate that they could do more. This is a growing problem for Ukraine, obviously directly related to the deficit of air defense, why Ukraine has made acquiring air defense a priority, especially air defense munitions from the West. This is a bigger problem than artillery ammunition because it's much easier to scale up production of artillery ammunition and there's more available in stock. Interceptors for air defense, we don't make that many, particularly for high-end systems like different types of Patriot batteries. And people tend to hold on to these systems jealously. They're, you know, uh, expensive, low availability items. The second issue is you see an improvement in Russian dynamic targeting, which is that beyond the front line... Which is something Russia struggled with pretty heavily for the first two years of the war. Yeah, and certainly, certainly for the first year. They could not translate theory into practice. They had the concepts, right? Recon strike, recon fire, contours or loops. They had a lot of the ideas. They sort of trained with them, but they couldn't realize much of this, right? Dynamic targeting. They lacked organizational capacity. They lacked the experience. They lacked the software. The force hadn't really matured with the different weapon systems and things they had acquired. But over the past two years, you've seen significant improvements. And now there's persistent Russian ISR drones and the like pretty far behind the line. Right. This again, partly due to the deficit of air defense on the Ukrainian side. And you can see that they are able to strike things in real time with Iskander short range ballistic missiles and go after high value targets. And the closer Russian forces creep to the transit hubs, to the cities, the more they hold these rear areas at risk. Right. And the more the challenge of defense becomes a systemic one. Right. Where. You're losing terrain incrementally that is gradually before you get to a point that you're forced to withdraw because you might face a sudden collapse of the line. Why hasn't Ukraine been able to impose some of the same difficulties they faced when on the offensive against Russia, back on Russia, now that Ukraine is in the defense and Russia is largely in an offensive position? To some extent they have, but here's the reality. The long-range precision strike capabilities that the United States and other countries have provided they were very effective when they were first introduced, right? But over time, they've driven cycles of adaptation and the development of counters. And what you can tell us first, their effectiveness has declined significantly, depending on what category you look at. You know, it might have gotten really bad in things like precision guide artillery shells, such as Excalibur. But, you know, HIMARS fired GMLRS missiles have also had their effectiveness reduced significantly due to Russian electronic warfare and reorganization of Russian command and control and logistics. So it's just much harder to employ them with the same effectiveness. I think in general, Ukrainian forces are still performing rather well on the defense as their combat effectiveness is very high. The challenge is that they are significantly outnumbered, right? If you look at combat effective infantry and ability to replace losses, they are very significantly outgunned, both literally outgunned and also in terms of ammunition available. And they did not have well-prepared defenses and fortifications, right? Also, unlike Russia, which significantly scaled up the ability to maintain its equipment, repair it, and is dealing with a common family of equipment, Ukraine over two years was handed a large zoo of different types of Western equipment in every single category and platform, but without a very good plan for how to actually sustain it. What should we expect to see unfold over the late spring and summer in this war? As you know, I'm, I'm always, of course, wary because military analysis isn't fortune-telling, but as best one can tell, the Russian campaign plan remains generally the same. They want to take the rest of the Donbass. That's their minimal war aim. They have a clear axis of advance that they've stuck in, aiming towards Pokrovsk and trying to sever the main roads running through the center of Donetsk up to Slavyansk and Krematorsk. Same push from Chasov Yar. It also looks, or at least I'm growing concern about all the Russian public discourse over the last two months regarding creating a buffer space around Kharkiv that is pushing out from Belgorod, right, to back into the Kharkiv region. And while I don't think Russia has the forces to take Kharkiv, Kharkiv is the second largest city in Ukraine. This is a very, very large city. But they may conduct an incursion to create the so-called buffer space that would effectively hold Kharkiv at risk. And more importantly, it would be a fixing action. That is, it would be something that Ukrainian forces have to deal with all the way up in the Northeast 
that would then create a lot of challenges for them in sustaining the rest of the line. In some ways, I've been surprised that Russia hasn't made Kharkiv more of a target since they lost it in that suddenly successful Ukrainian offensive a while ago, because, you know, yes, it's a large city, but Russia has turned cities to rubble before. And it seems like after they lost Kharkiv, they, they sort of fixed it and pressed pause there to focus on other theaters, which I can understand why. Why now this increased pressure, though? What's, what's changed? The things that changed is first, Ukraine had enough air defense to effectively deter the Russian Air Force. And as we've, as we've discussed before, the Russian Air Force has evolved over time to employ glide bombs at longer and longer ranges. So it's essentially brought itself more and more back into the fight over the course of last year. The second is that the Ukrainian military pushed the Russian military far enough back from Kharkiv so that they couldn't use artillery and other ground-based fires to you know, essentially level the city. And that's, that's what will place Kharkiv at risk. If the Russian, look, the, the distance from Belgorod to Kharkiv, right, across that border is very short overall between these two cities to Kharkiv. And so if the Russian military is able to conduct an incursion and then move themselves closer to Kharkiv, they could force at least a partial evacuation of that city. And that could be a major problem. So I, I am growing a bit concerned about it. I do think a lot of it still meant principally as a fixing action, but that's why. Kharkiv is you know, pretty well entrenched and defended, I think, at this point. But nonetheless, there's a danger there because it will take some months for Ukraine to address its manning situation. Right? Ammunition may come in two weeks, but manpower won't. That's going to take some time. And the size of the front line stays the same. And the manning situation is the kind of thing that's going to get probably a bit worse before it gets better. And so I think that in the coming months, the first question is, can Ukraine stabilize the lines? And could it deal with a resurgent Russian effort this summer? And, and to be clear, I don't think I or other folks necessarily know what it will look like. The one thing is clear what Russians are pushing for in terms of cities and the overall military strategy they have. But I don't know how much stronger the Russian offensive is going to be or what it's going to look like relative to what we're seeing now. And then the second question is, once Russia replaces losses from the sort of spring and summer, they're likely to make another push in the fall. And Ukraine will have to stabilize yet again in the fall. And the truth is that I don't think we will be able to confidently judge that the worst is over this year. So at least we see how the next couple of months go. My own kind of mental marker is July. And then again, later in the fall, the positive side of the equation is that Ukraine could hold Russia to incremental gains, stabilize the front, entrench, stabilize the manning situation as well, now that the funding and other things are there. And then Russian relative advantage next year, relative to the task and relative to the defense that Ukraine can mount, actually begins to decline in many ways. So it's not like Russia runs into a wall or anything, but it's to say that the, this year is principally Russia's window of opportunity. Let's talk about Russia's manpower situation. I think the, the unfortunate story is that from a quantity perspective, last year, Russia was able to stabilize the manpower situation. They were recruiting somewhere towards maybe 30,000 contract servicemen per month. This year, it's unclear, but probably it's a bit less, maybe 20, 25,000. This is enough for them to replace their losses, to not need another round of mobilization, and to generate additional army units and formations at the size of combined arms armies and to regenerate combat power over the course of this year. I don't think it's sufficient for them to build a massive amount of reserves so they could have a whole separate campaign to take cities like Kharkiv. But the growing asymmetry, the sort of the yawning gap has not just been in ammunition since the fall. It's been in manpower and, and most importantly in infantry and the 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 categories of manpower that you need in order to effectively conduct offensive operations or to hold terrain, right? The reality is that the Russian state has the money and the resources, and it's clear that Russians, particularly those from the regions, are willing to take this money to fight. Plus, they've also recruited prisoners under new types of contracts. Last year, there were units called Storm Z. Now there's a different type of contract with people signing up under Storm V, but they still have a pipeline of prisoners as well as part of the fight. So the challenge they have, though, is quality. If you look at the way Russian military is fighting, why, why these advantages have not turned into massive breakthroughs, right? If Ukraine has these challenges and the Russian military is materially advantaged, 
Why has there not been sort of a dramatic breakthrough? I think the answer is straightforward. The quality of the force isn't there. A lot of the good junior leadership is gone. Because, the Russian force. Yeah. A lot of the good leadership, junior leadership is gone. It was lost early on in the war. And so the Russian military is struggling with first employing forces at scale, right? Most of these actions are very small scale actions by platoons and, and companies, right? Occasionally you have like a battalion sized attack, but it's pretty, it's been pretty rare now in this war. Second, they lack the enablers, the capabilities to break through an effective defense. Ukrainians have mines, they have drones, they have fairly effective defenses mounted, and, and the Russian military doesn't necessarily have those adaptations in place, although you see them experimenting with lots of different ways to break through a defense. And the third is that this force, the way it's operating, can't generate momentum. So when they have a breach in a line, they can't really exploit it, right? There have been steady gains, though. There have been steady and incremental gains. That is correct. And that is what they're able to do. And the challenge is that since Avdiivka, they've been making incremental gains, right? And creeping their way towards their objectives. And that's the reality. And so this is why, you know, I've been concerned sort of looking at the picture, the way it's been developing. And on the Ukrainian side, you know, the Ukrainian commander in chief Sirsky most recently again stated that situation on the front has worsened. And those of us who follow it can see that it has worsened and that's not been stabilized yet. The truth, I think, is that the current situation we're in is actually quite positive relative to what it could be if the Russian military could actually operate at scale and could turn breaches or successes into major breakthroughs. And because they have these constraints in the capacity, Ukrainian military has the ability to retreat, right, reset lines, and hold them to incremental gains. The challenge is that don't know for a fact that these, like, these conditions and assumptions will remain true through the year, first. And second, there is a gradually then suddenly affect the war. And that's why it's critical to see what's, hap- what's going to happen in the next two, three months and to see if the Ukrainian military can effectively stabilize the line with an influx of assistance, right, and also what a Russian offensive, whatever that amounts to, is going to end up looking like this summer. I think that's a good place to end it, Mike. It's been great having you on the show. And I know if you're a War on the Rocks member, you can expect some good episodes on Mike's show, The Russia Contingency, out over the next few weeks. Stay safe and stay healthy. And of course, thanks for listening to War on the Rocks. <laughs>